that was WrestleMania 34. Man, oh man, that was a long haul. We really need to get this crap under wraps. WWE, professional wrestling, your big shows are too damn long. That said, I feel like it is fair to say with this show, it was like a roller coaster. The highs were really high and the lows were really low. But there is one thing that is for sure, no matter what the perspective or opinion, this was not a forgettable show. So the kickoff show, I did try to watch it in between coverage of the Masters. So of course, as I go to actually try to watch some of the kickoff show, the WWE Network decides it wants to act up and crap out on me several times. So I missed pretty much all of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal and the Cruiserweight Championship. Surely did not miss much, but again, if you're going to put this event on your network, it's probably a good idea to make sure it works. So Matt Hardy wins the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal with the help of a returning Bray Wyatt. Matt Hardy won? Wonderful! Would have been nice to see it live. Yes, ultimately, it's on the pre-show. It's the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. So who cares? Cruiserweight Championship, Mustafa Ali, Cedric Alexander, literally weeks upon weeks upon weeks with that Cruiserweight Tournament to get to this moment. And of course, it's on the pre-show. Cedric Alexander wins, but the real question is, does anybody really win being a part of the Cruiserweight division? And I would like to have told you my thoughts on the match, but again, the WWE Network didn't work for the match, and I'm not going to go back and watch it again. Why? Because it's the Cruiserweight, so it doesn't freaking matter. Mark is smart here, and I gotta tell ya, NXT TakeOver New Orleans was epic. It was the greatest NXT TakeOver of all time until the next one, and that will be the greatest of all time, because every NXT TakeOver show is the greatest of all time. And this Cruiserweight Championship match, Mustafa Ali... Cedric Alexander, mwah, say magnifique, this was awesome, this is what compelling cruiserweight action looks like, thank you Drake Maverick for putting out this tournament, thank you Triple H for saving 205 Live and the cruiserweights, and this match should have been on the main card. I think it's hilarious as all of the outrage there was over the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal, originally being named after the Fabulous Moolah, just for it to be on the damn kickoff show anyways. It didn't matter! <laughs> and ultimately, the result of this match won't matter. It's funny, you've spent months building up all this tension between Bayley and Sasha Banks to finally blow it off here, it would seem like, at a damn battle royal on the kickoff show of WrestleMania where it doesn't matter and neither one of them ended up winning the damn match. The person that did win the match, Naomi, gets a WrestleMania moment again this year, but the biggest thing of all, it would seem like her entrance is perfectly suited for a stage like WrestleMania and she just comes out like she's another one of the jabroni heifers. Again, even with the technical difficulties, it is important to keep in mind, this is the kickoff show, so it doesn't matter. Let's move on. Main card kicks off with the Intercontinental Championship Triple Threat Match. And I learned a couple of things before the match even started. Number one, thanks to Seth Rollins wearing those blue contacts in his entrance, I now know what the hell a White Walker is. Thank you, everyone. Number two, apparently Finn Balor is this strong advocate for the LGBTQ community. That's awesome. I can totally believe that Finny the Twink would be. And I hope this is something that he embraces. I hope this is something the WWE really gets behind because, frankly, it could be the most important, significant thing that Finn Balor ever does in his career, and I mean that. The last thing I learned was that apparently the Miz raided Okada's closet and Becky Lynch's closet uh, before WrestleMania to get his ring gear, and he shall now forever be known as the Miz Maker.
Just what I learned, I've got to say, this match was pretty damn good. This was a really solid opener to WrestleMania. These three guys had really good chemistry with each other, and it showed. It really showed. And while I was a staunch proponent of The Miz deserving this win here, deserving this shine, we all know how the WWE loves to make history, and they had to have Seth Rollins win because now he's a Grand Slam champion. And think about this, people. All three members of the Shield are now Grand Slam champions. Nonetheless, this was a really good way to kick off WrestleMania. I have to say I was completely surprised that the SmackDown Women's Championship went on second. I thought this match was destined to be much later in the night. Because of the participants, because you had your first ever Women's Royal Rumble winner in this match, I thought this might go on third to last or second to last. But it was the second match on the main card. And maybe, thankfully for it, it was. This match did have the big fight feel that a lot of people were talking about. And I gotta say, even with the occasional choppy moments that did happen in this match, it was delivering. It was delivering really, really nicely. It was following up on the momentum from that icy title triple threat opener. And then the finish happened. I guess some people did envision that Charlotte would end the streak. I guess some people did envision that it could happen here. But I still can't believe it happened here. New Orleans, apparently, is the place where streaks go to die. And I don't get it. I understand Vince didn't create the streak. Hunter did, so Vince doesn't give a crap about it. I also understand that ultimately, just because he had Asuka win the Women's Royal Rumble doesn't mean that he's ready to put a women's title on her. I also understand that Charlotte is a flair, so that's going to carry a tremendous amount of political power. And I also understand here that you're potentially building up to her and Rousey main eventing 35. But looking at this... It seemed like the best win-win situation for everybody involved. My opinion was to have Carmella cash in here on Charlotte after Charlotte and Asuka beat the hell out of each other. That way, nobody's really got to lose. Carmella comes across with massive heat, a real snake, and then Charlotte and or Asuka could go after her. And now you've got a real reason for a return match. Now you don't. Also, talking about building up potentially to Charlotte and Rousey next year. Does that mean that Charlotte is going to carry this strap for another year? Ah, ah. Oh, you spend two and a half years building it up. This whole streak thing, just to give it to Charlotte, who doesn't fucking need it because you're going to pound her down everybody's throat any damn ways. Shocking and surprising is shocking and surprising. Just because it's shocking and surprising doesn't make it good. This, to me, was a whiff. This, to me, was a miss. Understanding the bigger picture at play, that still doesn't mean it was good. And it was a terrible finish to what was shaping up to be a really, really good match. And the most ridiculous thing of all about ending Asuka's streak here at WrestleMania and doing it in this way is it didn't even end up being the final primary focus of the match. Because after all this time of all these ridiculous cutaways of John Cena in the crowd and all that came with that, now he's getting news that The Undertaker is there. So the walking freaking gift maker jumps the barrier because, of course, nobody's going to stop him even though he's a fan that happens to be there. And he goes running and makes a beeline right past Asuka and up the damn ramp, just showing you... It doesn't matter what these people are doing. It's still to this day about breakfast club business, bitches. The epitome to me of a match that was just there, had nothing special happen, had nothing memorable happen, and it was just another example of Finn's fucking with the fans, was this United States Championship Fatal 4-Way. I guess Vince McMahon, Road Dog, think the best way to celebrate Rusev Day is to make a Maharasha Day. What the actual F is going on here? The guy that's the most over in the match, not only does he not win, you have him eat the pin. Just so that way we can go back to putting another strap on freaking Jinder Mahal. Christ almighty. What a way to ruin Rusev Day. I can't lie. As much as I was surprised about the SmackDown Women's Championship going second, I was even more surprised by the Kurt Angle, Ronda Rousey versus Triple H, Stephanie McMahon match going fourth on this show. 
I was floored. This had God, a McMahon, Kurt Angle, and arguably your most notable women signing ever. And you buried this in the second hour of the show. All I got to say is, maybe this match should have main evented, huh? Huh? Like, maybe somebody was out there suggesting to you that maybe this match should have main evented. You think it maybe should have now? Now, surely you could say, well, another three hours later, maybe the match doesn't play as well. Maybe it doesn't. But I find that very, very hard to believe. I do have to point out, though, that it was funny how Stephanie could thwart several attempts at the arm bar, but people like Misha Tate in the real world can't. But... It's even more ridiculous to me that Hunter had to sell that shit from Ronda Rousey. Like, I'm supposed to buy that? I'm supposed to believe that? Fucking God sitting there selling it like this in the corner? Give me a break and how ridiculous. Because if he would have actually hit a spot on her, like hit her with a pedigree, or actually hit her back, then all oh God, the whole world would have fucking blown up a bunch of hypocritical bullshit. You come at him like a man, he deserves to whoop your ass like a man, period. Once you get past kind of the foolishness at moments where this match kind of lost me a little bit, this could not have been a better debut for Ronda Rousey. It took him a long time to get to her, and I think not enough credit is being given to Triple H and particularly Stephanie, who really made this work, who really made this go. Rhonda kicked ass here. I have to give her credit. She was outstanding. She, based off of this performance, has to give you some hope that this thing might work out in terms of the goods in the ring. The other stuff, that remains to be determined. That needs a lot of work. But the actual ass-kicking elements that she brings in, that kind of big fight feel, it translates to the WWE ring. It clearly shows. And to me, this match was way better than it had any business being and it was just phenomenal. It was outstanding. To me, it was clearly, clearly the match of the night. And I don't know how anything else truly measures up to this. And what a damn shame that it didn't main event. What a damn shame that it was buried in the second hour of the show. But if you're looking for positives out of this night... For the WWE, there isn't a bigger positive than Ronda Rousey performing as well as she did and truly being the star of the night. So granted, it was going to be really, really hard to follow up on that mixed tag match. But inherently, that SmackDown Tag Team Championship triple threat was just going to be a failure no matter where it was on a card. It's great, the New Days and the Usos. They actually get on the WrestleMania main card this year. But the WWE, Road Dog decides to reward these guys, two of the best tag teams you've had in the company in a long, long time, by putting them in this garbage-ass triple threat, which should have had a table stipulation or a ladder stipulation or a TLC stipulation to it, something this car could have really used to help balance things out a little bit. You make it massively boring. You barely give either one of these teams any fucking shine at all. Just so that way, the fucking tag team that matters the least gets the fucking win here. This was dumb. It was boring. It was stupid. And easily one of the worst matches of the night. Well, the show definitely needed a little bit of a pick-me-up after that lame-ass triple threat tag match. And out comes John Cena. And the moment at hand is finally here. What's going to happen? Is it for John Cena, whom the bell tolls? Are we going to get The Undertaker? Well, the WWE initially went into epic troll mode. God, this was freaking awesome. Out comes Elias. You want to get heat on somebody. You want to keep heat on somebody. Have everybody think of the freaking Undertakers coming back at WrestleMania. And have Elias walk out in front of 78,000 plus damn people playing the guitar, and singing a damn song as he's coming down the ramp. God, I loved every minute of this until Cena goes to the crowd and he gets to sit down and after Elias is done singing, here comes Cena and he wipes him quickly out. I wanted Elias to have a WrestleMania moment. And by God, they gave me, Elias, a WrestleMania moment that I will never forget. 
I loved it up until the end of it, which didn't go so well. But that doesn't matter. We'll pretend like it doesn't happen. We'll sit there and edit it out in post-production in our minds. That's what we'll do, okay? I imagine once this happened with Elias, a lot of you are wondering, is that it? Is that really it? No, there's got to be more to this, doesn't there? Well, you ultimately got your answer. The Undertaker came. And a lot of people in the crowd, it sounded like came too. But imagine if I told you five years ago that outside of Undertaker vs. Sting, one of the other real dream matches you had left for WrestleMania was Undertaker vs. John Cena. And a lot of you would have agreed with that assessment. It was one of the big money matches that the WWE could do. That you would finally get it in 2018 at WrestleMania 34. But in that time, The Undertaker not only has had his undefeated streak at WrestleMania snapped by Brock Lesnar, he has also lost to Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. You've now gotten to the point where John Cena is the epitome of a part-time who-gives-a-crap performer. The whole build-up to this match would have involved weeks of The Undertaker not being there, John Cena calling him out, dissing him, mocking him, talking shit about him, all the while The Undertaker still doesn't answer him, just so that way we actually get to WrestleMania 34, and this is a completely unannounced, unadvertised match, but you finally get it, only to have The Undertaker squash John Cena in less than three minutes. I can understand why a lot of people are sitting there and saying, what the actual F? What is going on here? They're disappointed. They're shocked. Borderline butthurt. I get it. I completely, totally get it. Years of looking forward to it. And this is what you get. The only thing that would have potentially been appealing five years ago if I would have told you this scenario played out was that Cena would have gotten squashed in less than three minutes of WrestleMania. And even now that doesn't seem to matter as much. But I've got to say this. Did you really want to risk Taker having a long match here? Did you really want to go down that route? Taker winning was the best option. Because especially with Reigns and Lesnar facing off in the main event, could you really have Cena beat him? It doesn't mean as much if those two guys have beat Taker at Mania, and they're the only two just to have Cena do it in the same night. That would be the epitome of Breakfast Club bullshit. Furthermore... This was the only way this felt like this really was going to work. And even before it happened, I asked the question, is Taker going to squash Cena? Because this show really needed a squash match. Didn't expect it here, but we got it here. But honestly, it worked. I mean, between the big boot that Cena totally (laughs) freaking went down to early on, to the freaking sit-up gift for the ages with Cena freaking out and falling back, does The Undertaker, after hitting the Tombstone pile driver, teabag and Cena asking him how my nut stays? To Cena popping a little bit of a two and a half to three inch Jort Johnson? I mean, it had everything you needed in a couple of minutes. The whole build up to this was trash anyways. What the hell made you think that this was going to be awesome? But that said, it worked. It really worked. It was about the best thing you could do to make this be not such a bad situation. Because no matter what to me, now that the streak is over, Taker facing somebody at Mania is pretty much a lose-lose. This was the least lose you could possibly do. That's about the best thing I can say about it. It was at this point that the WWE decided to celebrate the inductees into the 2018 WWE Hall of Fame class. It was cool to see Hillbilly Jim. Jarius Robertson was freaking awesome. I got to say that. He absolutely was. The dude just has a presence about him. He lights up the room wherever he goes. The Dudleys are the Dudleys. Mark motherfucking Henry finally got his rightful place in the WWE Hall of Fame. You damn right. Now the Hall of Fame is the Hall of Pain. Where's my motherfucking cheeseburger? Yes. That's for you, Big Smoke. And of course, Goldberg, looking beastly. 
Hey, dude could rock a suit. And, and this was a decent Hall of Fame class, all right? Screw Kid Rock and all that. But, hey, it was a decent Hall of Fame class, and it was cool to see some of these guys get their moment in the sun. <sighs> To talk about the other thing. Oh, I just did your word. Just gonna twirl this like that. Oh, I got your whole thing right here. Put this in your fucking hall of fame. I said, I'm done with this The WWE actually followed through on it. We'll stick this in your fucking hall of fame and smoke it. The dude broke 10,000 guitars, didn't draw a goddamn dime, he founded two wrestling companies as vanity projects for his own fucking ego, and he ruined both of them sons of bitches. Everything he does absolutely fucking sucks. His Hall of Fame speech sucks. Oh, I'm going to make people feel sorry for me. Fuck that piece of crap. This guy has ultimately benefited significantly from befriending people in important places such as Vince Russo and of course his buddy the roadie road dog who when he's not busy trying to run fucking smack down into the damn crowd he is of course advocating for and fighting for his butt buddy to become the new general manager of Smackdown Live nobody cares if you sing at the Hall of Fame ceremony cause you suck Nobody wants to hear your speech because ding dong dumb dick, you absolutely suck. Sitting there going your whole life trying to go and fucking get Kurt Angle sloppy seconds. So of course it's only natural that you gotta bring your sorry ass back to WWE with your fucking pathetic hands out. What are you gonna do? Sell everybody fucking 24 karat gold bars backstage? What a bunch of garbage. He sucks. He always has sucked. He is nothing more than a Memphis mid-card piece of crap. He's your founder. I oh, found this. Fuck Jeff Jack. Imagine if I told you just a few short months ago that Daniel Bryan would actually be wrestling at WrestleMania 34 as an active in-ring competitor teaming up with a Shane McMahon who recently got out of the hospital after a stint with diverticulitis and is sitting there still bumping around all over the damn place and they're facing off against Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. What if I told you, in spite of all of that, you would get a largely forgettable match that honestly, what was thought to be a highlight of the night in theory with Daniel Bryan's return as an in-ring competitor is now largely forgotten and absolutely no one is talking about. Imagine if I told you that a few months ago. You would have thought I was on crazy pills. Well, that's basically exactly what happened. And to me, this shows the importance of properly structuring a match sitting there and taking Daniel Bryan out before it even starts, so that way he's out there in a stretcher and you got Shane bumping around to then later Daniel Bryan comes in and makes a save, but it doesn't properly build up to the hot tag, and even the hot tag isn't that particularly hot. This story that seemed to almost be begging for somebody to turn on the other person, whether it's Daniel Bryan or whether it was Shane McMahon, it didn't happen. It was just weird. The match was weird. The fact that it was this late in the night also kind of felt like it was weird. It really, to me, I argued before, this should have opened the show, and maybe it didn't need to open the show, but it needed to happen early on in the night because even as Daniel Bryan's out there, to me, the crowd wasn't quite as hot for it as I expected them to be. They were still hot for it, but they didn't want it like really deep, deep, deep bad. And you could tell today, as I record this, because nobody is talking about it. Just bizarre. The Sled Daddy, nobody else is going to ruin this moment for me. Daniel Bryan is back in a WWE ring. Yes, yes, yes. Straight to the main event with him because he's the best motherfucker wrestler in the world. The Raw Women's Championship, I still feel like, could have benefited from being a squash. I feel like it would have been better for Alexa, most certainly would have been better for Nia Jax, especially with all the times she's gotten pinned and had to tap out, and she's supposed to be this big giant. She was looking good last night, though. She was looking good. But with that said, this match still worked for me. 
these ladies went out there and had an adequate WrestleMania match. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't showcase. But this wasn't the type of match that should have had to have been like that. And for the idiots that might be out there saying, Whoa, the cruiserweight match should have been in the main card and this should have been a pre-show. Let me give a shit about 205 Live. Let me give a crap about the damn cruiserweights. It was exactly where the hell it belonged. This was a match, a story that's been in the works for months. And both of these ladies deserved a main card match at WrestleMania way the hell more than freaking Cedric Alexander or freaking Mustafa Ali. Get the fuck over it. And I'm so happy Nia Jax, after all the crap she's put up with, all the crap that she gets, got her WrestleMania moment here. WWE Championship match should main event WrestleMania. <laughs> In your fucking face! I told you! I told you! I tried to warn you! But nah, you didn't want to listen, and you know what? Nah! Because if this would have been everything you knuckleheads had pumped it up to be, you would never let me hear the end of it. So guess what? Tell me. Tell me how my ass tastes. You can bow down and kiss my ass. Because hashtag Schlag Daddy was right. And how dare you ever doubt that? Main event my fucking ass. And every single excuse that you idiots out there are going to throw is complete and total garbage. Only surpassed by the flaming hot garbage that this match was. Ooh, it needs plenty of time. It had the second most time on this card. Ooh, as long as they didn't get hold back. They didn't hold them back. They just worked a shitty match. Oh, you put Nakamura in this big spot against AJ Styles and he's going to deliver. Ding dong, dumb dicks. You have a whole catalog of work here with Nakamura on, on the main roster that indicates his ring work absolutely sucks. And guess what? This match absolutely sucked. No, there's no excuse. There's no defending it. You guys were just flat out wrong. I told you you didn't want this thing that late in the goddamn night because you'd have no energy. Gee, I can't imagine why I would be right. Gee, I can't imagine why I would be right telling you that there was nothing in Nakamura's main roster history that indicated that he was magically going to pull a rabbit out of his fucking ass at WrestleMania. And I can't imagine why people wouldn't be even more excited about a match that Road Dog was in charge of writing the build-up for. This was trash. Straight trash. Don't sit there and make excuses. Don't sit there and try to defend it. Don't sit there and try to justify it. It doesn't make you less of a fan of Nakamura or AJ Styles to admit that these guys went out there at WrestleMania third to last on the card and freaking stunk up the damn Superdome because that's exactly what happened. And no, the heel turn doesn't save it. Because again, I come back to, even if the heel turn was a little surprising for some of you, and a little shocking for some of you, it still comes down to, Road Dog's gonna be the one writing this. So how the fuck do you think this is gonna go? This has to go down as one of the most disappointing WrestleMania matches of all time, of all time, of all time. And for you guys, the humble pie and the crow that you must be required to eat here, has to taste really bad. But I gotta tell you, sitting here, sitting here, victory tastes oh so sweet. Main event, main event my ass. This thing could have been on the kickoff show. At least then we would have known we shouldn't have given a crap about it. It was terrible. Even I didn't expect it to be this damn bad. And I'm not overselling it just to be an ass. It was that bad. Accept it, admit it, and move the hell on. Uh, it was bad. That was so, so bad. I can't believe it. Life isn't even worth living anymore. Shinsuke, AJ, go away. Uh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. It, it's not worth living life anymore. Uh, Wait, why? Why? Shinsuke turned heel. Shinsuke turned heel. Oh, good God almighty! Shinsuke Nakamura turned heel! 
Oh, it got good. So the match was bad. So what? So it stunk. Who cares? Shinsuke's heel now. It's like the match didn't even happen. Now, the story with him and AJ is gonna really pick up. And business is about to get interesting. I tried to tell you. I tried to warn you. But... As has been the history for seven plus years, so many of you don't want to listen and then afterwards where I'm vindicated and proven right, we sit there and pretend like I'm not. Well, you can't duck and dodge this one. Anyways, moving on, thankfully from that steaming pile of garbage, we go to something else. That is just the most bizarre thing that I think I've ever seen at WrestleMania. All this hype! About Braun Strowman and a mystery tag team partner and who it could be to take on the bar. Is it going to be the big show? Is it going to be Rey Mysterio? Well, now imagine if I told you you were going to be a fan that would go down to New Orleans, pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to experience WrestleMania week, WrestleMania weekend bought your ticket to the Superdome for WrestleMania 34 to sit there and watch Braun Strowman pick a tag team partner out of the crowd. Imagine if you did all of that to see Braun Strowman pick a little kid out of the crowd that you are initially unable to determine whether or not that child is a boy or a girl. Imagine that he picks out said child and there maybe is a morbid curiosity that maybe the kid is gender fluid and maybe you don't want to know the gender. You might just call that child Pat and everybody can guess whether it is a boy or a girl. Now imagine that this child who looks terrified as all hell walks down with Braun Strowman to the ring because of course his parents apparently don't care that some big beefy dude is walking off with their young child. And then imagine that that kid named Nicholas goes on to get one of the biggest reactions of the night. Nicholas is a star. Nothing can follow Nicholas. Nothing can stop Nicholas. Whether you loved it or whether you thought it was the Biggest waste of time in WWE history. Beyond question, this was the epitome of a surprise. Nicholas Fever has come to WWE. Nicholas Fever is going to sweep and take over the world. I don't know what else to say other than if you were going to do this with a kid, it probably should have A, been Jarius Robertson, or B, King Maxwell, because last time Piglet and I checked, King Maxwell is undefeated in professional wrestling. Maybe not have a kid that looks so terrified to be out there, and if you're going to do it, maybe at least have the kid pick up the pinfall. I'm just saying. I don't know what else to say at this point. Imagine being the person that comes up with this idea. Hey, we're going to take one of the referee's sons and we're going to have him be Braun Strowman's tag team partner. I know. Pig was looking like, what the fuck is going on here? Imagine being the person that comes up with that idea and be, imagine being Vince McMahon and signing off on that idea and then signing off on placing this match as second to last on the card. The only word to describe this is weird. It's weird. And you could tell by the look on Piglet's face that she is not impressed. For a night like this, and a very, very long one at that, after seeing that crap that happened with Braun Strowman and the unstoppable force that is Nicholas, I'm like, oh God, this Universal Championship match is going to be an epic disaster of a main event. And oh, did it live up to those expectations. And so, so much more. You don't have a Seth Rollins hanging out there with that money in the bank matzo ball to save you this time. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. 
sometimes be careful what you wish for, WWE, because you just might get it. Y'all wanted to dig your heels in. You wanted to be stubborn. This was the match you've been building up to for a year. Featuring the two the guys on your raw brand and in your company. By God, we're going to main event him at WrestleMania. Screw what happens. Well, you found out how bad of a strategy that can be. Good God, this was awful. This is not about Lesnar hate. This is not about Reigns hate. Bad is bad. Terrible is terrible. And awful is awful. And Shinsuke and AJ was awful. This match was every bit as awful and possibly more. You build up the F5 for an entire year. Once Brock hits it, it's over. To get here to WrestleMania, and everybody knows that Roman's going to kick out of it. That's part of the story. But you ultimately have him kick out of five of these damn F5s and nobody cares. Like the WWE has convinced themselves they're in the reaction business, not in the hero and villain business. What happens when the story you've been building up to for a year happens, closes out, and it goes over like a fart in church? This is not about hijacking the show. This is not about booing it. This is not about doing other crap. Roman kicks out of five F5s and nobody cares. Nobody reacts. It goes over like a fart in church. And then throughout the match, you got fans chanting, boring, this is awful. And yes, you could say it is just solely about Roman Reigns hate, and that is a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. It's just so dumb on so many different freaking levels. You got Roman bleeding his brains out like a fucking stuffed pig, and it just looks shitty. Everything about this was stupid. Like, Brock Lesnar actually cared. But then you realize it's Brock Lesnar, and at some point in time, that shtick is kind of worn thin, too. I gotta say, though, the real surprise of the night, out of everything that happened, the number one top surprise of the night was you built up to this match for a year just for Brock Lesnar to retain. So literally everything you did for the last year with Roman, with Brock, was a gigantic waste of fucking time because you were back to the status quo. And maybe we should have seen this coming because Brock is so close to passing CM Punk in terms of longest title reign. You gotta figure that's the direction they're going with this. And maybe we've got the Bobby Lashley matzo ball down the road and we can look forward to that. But for this night, for this moment, this main event at WrestleMania 34, this was garbage. Hot, steaming, stinking, fucking garbage. And you can't just blame Brock, and you just can't blame Roman. They were both participants in this. If they never main event at WrestleMania again, that would be just fine with me. You've now done this four consecutive times with Roman. I'm not just trying to hate on the dude, but Jesus Christ, at some point in time, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Figure out a different path or move the hell on to somebody else. And as far as the Brock shit, I still don't get why there are these people out there that think Brock is great or Brock is awesome. He is epically fucking boring. And if he was good enough and talented enough and over enough, the crowd, no matter what, wouldn't have been chanting boring and this is freaking awful and playing with goddamn beach balls and themselves and their penises. Like, this is the way you think you're going to send the people home happy? All of this building up to all of this just to sit there and have fucking Roman lose? What the fuck? I don't even give a shit. That was stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Get out of my camera shot, Piglet. This is summer's time. I can't believe they would do that to Romy's. He sat there and bled. He sat there and kicked out a 5 at 5 Just so that way the sandwich salesman could retain the universal title? That's stupid. They would have never done this to Cena. It's okay, though, Romy's. You'll be back. Fuck the haters. You'll be back.
You're still a bigger star than Shinsuke or AJ could ever be. This was stupid. Hell yeah, bitches. You know what, Summer is absolutely right. It's bad enough this show was this damn long. It's even worse that it was this damn long to get to this main event to have it be the steaming pile of garbage that it was. And it's even more ridiculous that you job out Roman Reigns like this at a moment like this. This is the shit that does not help him. Like the whole story to me between Brock and Roman went sideways as soon as Roman didn't bust out of those cuffs on Raw. When you tried to make him a sympathetic guy instead of a badass, it was doomed to fail. I can't imagine though WWE ever having John Cena at his run at the top, main eventing WrestleMania, mind you, main eventing and doing the job clean like this without it being a triple threat or without there being interference or some other type of bullshit. They wouldn't have done this to Cena. But yet, lo and behold, here we go. They're doing it with freaking Roman Reigns. So he sits there and beats God at 32. He beats the freaking Undertaker at 33. He's the dude that's going to be around a lot longer, whether people like it or not. But you're not going to have him go over Lesnar at 34? What the fuck is wrong with this company? I can imagine the grades for this WrestleMania are going to be all over the board. And I'm not surprised by that. To me, this was nowhere near the worst WrestleMania of all time. At least I can say I won't forget this WrestleMania. There are several things I'm going to remember about this WrestleMania. But again, just because I can remember them doesn't necessarily make it good. There were highlights, though. There were some really good things. But like I said at the beginning, it was a roller coaster. You go really, really high, and they come way, way down. Almost like free fall. And it's largely a creation of the WWE's own doing. When you make your shows this damn way too long, you create a situation where there is a much greater chance for error. You're going to create your own mistakes, and especially when that's the shit that you throw out there in the last hour knowing the people are fucking gassed? You deserve all the crap that you get. The structure of this card ended up being atrocious. When you got your WWE Championship match and your Universal Championship match completely stinking up the fucking joint, that is not a great sign for your show. When easily your best match features the person in their first ever match coming off of the UFC, that's not a great thing. I'm just saying. Golly. In retrospect, I'm glad I didn't go to this show. Yes, it sucks I didn't get to see Mark Henry inducted in the WWE Hall of Fame in person. Yes, it sucks that once again I did not get to see The Undertaker wrestle at WrestleMania in person. Those things wouldn't have been worth it to me for this greater egg of a show that we got. Thank God it's over. Good God Almighty, thank God it's over. Now can we please stop making these shows so damn long? Anyways, I am the Schleg Daddy. And as always, this is OTRS Central. Go to Pro Wrestling Tees, buy the OTRS Central shirt. And remember, as the shirt says, it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And what I really need right now after last night is about a two or three hour long nap.